webinar. This is um, Functional Safety 101. We're going to talk about the IEC 61508 and 61511 standards and what they mean. Just a little housekeeping quickly. There is a questions tab on your portal. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, go ahead and type them in the questions tab. I'll make sure to save some time at the end and answer all of the questions that I can. Also, there this um, recording is going this webinar is going to be recorded. It will be available on the web Exeter website and the Exeter YouTube channel. And if you signed up for the webinar, you will also get emailed a copy of the slides later this week. Today we're going to talk about all of the basics of functional safety and IEC 61508 and IEC 61511. We're going to talk about why the they were put in place. We're going to talk about functional safety standards, the safety life cycle, key documentation needed for to comply with the standards and the safety life cycle. We're going to talk about information that's supplied to end users, or if you're an end user, what you need to be looking for, what end users are doing with the information, some critical issues with functional safety, why it's so important to have data integrity, what product certification involves, and roles and responsibilities. So as you can see, there is a lot of information that we're going to cover today. Um, just giving a brief overview on all of these topics because it's only an hour webinar. But if you want more information on any one of these topics, we have detailed webinars on all of these. So you can just go to the Exeter website. We have webinars, we have blogs, and white papers. So any information that we have, we like to publish and share so that everybody knows what's going on and the most current and up-to-date information on functional safety. Just real quick, my name is Lauren Stewart. I work at Exida. I started in custom design and manufacturing, but now I work with Exida focusing on our mechanical customers. I do product certification and on-site audits. We go through the safety cases with our customers, but I also do a lot of research on stiction and the mechanical failure rates and the 2H database. So we cover a little bit of everything. We have worldwide locations. I like to say no matter where we are or where you are or your customer is, we have somebody close by. So we have somebody in your area of the world, no matter where that is, to help with all of your functional safety needs. Exit is involved with the complete supply chain of functional safety in multiple industry sectors from the original equipment manufacturers who require product certification throughout to the end users that use the product. Exeter provides software tools and training and consulting and procedures related to functional safety and security and reliability. We can be broken up into different main product and service categories. Um, we like to say that no matter what you deal with functional safety, whether it's the process, the products, or the people, we have you covered. We deal with consulting in process safety and alarm management and cybersecurity. We have our engineer software and our tools. We have our product certification in functional safety, cybersecurity, and network robustness. We have our training. You can come to us. We can come to you. Anything dealing with functional safety. We have our reference materials, our databases, our textbooks, our market studies, our white papers, things like webinars and blogs that we continuously publish, and our personnel certification. We're going to talk a little
a little bit more about um, product certification later on in the webinar, but when somebody completes a product certification, this is what the end result is. You receive a certificate, and this certificate basically says that you have been approved by Exida um, in functional safety, and it has a lot of information throughout the um, certificate on the front and the back. Um, Exida has established schemes for functional safety and cybersecurity of systems, of products, of components, and of personnel. And this functional safety certification involves a detailed analysis of both the engineering process and the designs, resulting in random failure rates in all different failure modes, and we're going to talk about why that's important later on. But we also have cybersecurity certification, and it involves a detailed analysis of the engineering process, the cyber defense mechanisms, and the network robustness. This is just a quick overview of our reference materials. We like to make sure that everything all of the research, all of our process, all of our database, it's all published information. We want to make sure that the most current and up-to-date material on the market is out there for you to use. We want to make sure that the world is a safer place. We don't want to hide this information. We want to be an open book. So you can look at our website, our um, blogs, our webinars, our books, our white papers, um, all of the speeches we give at different conferences, and get the most up-to-date information of our failure rates, our database, our process, and everything that we are researching. So let's get into the main reason why you are here today, and it is understanding IEC 61508 and 511. We're going to break the functional safety standards up into many sections today and like I said we're going to give a brief overview on all of the different all of these different topics if you want more detailed information um, you can certainly email us or you can look on our website for more detailed information but we're going to start with looking at the functional safety standards So if you're new to functional safety, you might be, well, what is functional safety? Why is it important? And that's the main question we want to answer today. What is functional safety? Why will I possibly care about this? And to do that, we're going to start with the scope of IEC 61508. We're going to look at how the standard applies to both electrical and mechanical devices, and some people have questions about that. And we're also going to look at what the standard addresses. We're going to break it up into the safety life cycle, systematic faults, and random faults. To get the best overview, I like to start with a definition. And IEC 61508 defines functional safety as the automatic safety function either perform the intended function correctly or the system will fail in a predictable or safe manner. And that's important to have in your head when we go through this webinar. Yes, you want the safety function to always perform the intended function. That is the best case scenario. But if that cannot happen, you want it to be able to shut down the system in a safe manner or a predictable manner so you do not have an accident or a disaster on your hands. So most people think of it just, it does the goal, but functional safety always also wants you to look at how the system can fail in a predictable or a safe manner. IEC 61508 standard was created when people from all different working groups and national standard bodies from all around the globe um, came together to create the IEC 61508 standard. Um, you have DINV, 
19250, which is the fundamental safety aspects to be considered for measurements and control equipment. Um, you have the principles for computer and safety related systems. You have the application of safety instrumented systems for a process industry. And the European Workshop on Industrial Computer Safety and the UK Health and Safety Executive Guidelines for Programmable Electronic Systems. And the group came together to create one standard for functional safety. The IEC 61508 standard applies to automatic protection systems, um, EEPE, which is electric, electronic and programmable electronic equipment. It provides measures of protection against random hardware failures and also systematic design failures. It can be applied to both project level work and product level work. So it can be applied to bespoke systems and also off-the-shelf products. IEC 61508 is a basic safety standard upon which other functional standards get developed. So anyone making a safety related electrical, electronic or programmable electronic product for use by other OEMs should basically be following this standard. It's broken up into four parts um, plus um, three guideline parts. It defines the concept of safety integrity level and the safety life cycle. And the certification is optional, but assessment against the requirements of 61508 is not. And um, it needs to be done by a third party certification. It's not it doesn't have to be done by a third party certification body, but it is valued by end users if a third party um, does the certification. IEC 61508 started as a non-governmental industry standard and it has grown steadily in its use of enforcement. Currently, it's level of use and application is so prevalent that it's almost unheard of or dangerous for an organization to just completely ignore the standards recommendations. As most societies become more risk adverse, compliance with IEC 61508 is becoming almost mandatory in most parts of the industrialized world. In some countries, it is actually um, accepted by governments with force of laws, but most cases, it's just common engineering practices. And every um, and when accidents do happen in some portions of the world, the standards can actually be cited in civil cases as common accepted standard of practice or good engineering practices. So the first question a lot of people have, especially the people that I work with in the mechanical group, they look at the definition of an EEPE-based system. Okay, you have electrical, you have electronic, you have programmable electronic. Well, where's mechanical? Does this mean that my valve or actuator does not need to be certified per IEC 61508? So what I suggest to people when they ask me about that is I say just Google it. And the first Google um, site or result that is found is the actual IEC 61508 um, FAQ page. And as you can see, um, the fourth answer is about mechanical products. So we're going to zoom in so you can see closely. 
what IEC 61508 itself says that although you might not be able to um, meet every single requirement for, say, a valve, you won't have the software requirements. But there are all the other requirements of the standards do need to be met. So if you have a simple valve, you won't meet every single requirements, but you are expected to meet most of them. And that is how mechanical devices must also be included in the IEC 61508 certification. When you look at the standards, um, there's different IEC um, standards. What the what we're going to mostly be talking about today is IEC 61508 and IEC 61511. IEC 61508 is known as the umbrella standard. It is the international performance-based standard for all industries, and this applies to, uh, applies to suppliers. From that standard, it is then broken up into different substandards or specialties. You have a standard for the nuclear section, you have a machinery section, and you have a process industry sector. And we are also going to be looking at some of IEC 61511, which is the process industry sector um, standard. When talking about IEC 61508 and IEC 61511, one of the main reasons you might be looking at um, certification is maybe your customers are asking for it, or maybe you want to be safer. But we always take a look at what are end users or your customers doing. And that is going to look at the process industry sector, or IEC 61511. We're going to look at why is there a need. We're going to look at um, safety instrumented systems and safety instrumented functions along with the safety life cycle. And in doing so, you might understand more why IEC 61508 is prevalent. IEC 61511 standard is a user-focused standard, but it does not assign individual responsibilities. That must be done for any given project, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. There are no detailed requirements for embedded software or high-level languages like C++. Um, it's going to refer back to IEC 61508 for that. They're very complementary of each other. And it has the same life cycle and SIL concepts as IEC 61508, but IEC 61511 is more in the process industry language. There are three sections of the standard. There's a requirement section, a guideline section, and a SIL selection section. Well, why is there a need for IEC 61508? Who really cares? The best way I can demonstrate why to care is maybe an example. IEC 61511 defines a safety instrumented system as an instrumented system used to implement one or more safety instrumented functions. A safety instrumented system is composed of any combination of sensors, logic solvers, and final elements. So there are no restrictions as to what type of technology is used or the size of the system. A safety instrumented system could comprise of a single function, but often they have anything from a handful to several hundred functions depending on the application. A safety instrumented system is much like a basic process control system in that both have sensors and logic solvers and final elements. However, 
a sys operates completely different mode and has a unique design and maintenance or mechanical integrity requirements. So for a sys, you need to have either automatically take an industrial process to a safe state when the specific conditions are violated, permit the process to move forward in a safe manner when the specific conditions are allowed, or take action to mitigate the consequence of an industrial hazard. When we look at safety instrumented systems, we also need to understand what a safety instrumented function is. And a safety instrumented function is a safety function with a specific safety integrity level, or a SIL, which is necessary to achieve the functions, functional safety, and which can be either a safety instrumented protection function or a safety instrumented control function. And only a SIF can have a safety integrity level assigned. We do not assign SIL to other safety devices like maybe a check valve or a relief valve. A protection function assumes that the frequency of demand on the SIF is low, say once per year or even less, which is typical of many of the process industry applications. If there is a continuous function such as a high frequency of demand or machinery, then it is called a control function and not a protection function anymore. So what are some examples of SIFs? Well, on detecting a high temperature, it could prevent a column rupture by shutting off steam flow to a reboiler. Okay, that, that's pretty important. Or on detecting a high pressure, it could prevent a tank rupture by opening a valve to a relief system. That's pretty important too. What about on detecting a high level, it opens a drain valve to direct excess liquid to waste sump to reduce environmental damage. What about on detecting a fire, issuing an alarm to minimize damage and possible injury? Are all these examples of SIFs? Well, not really. The fire alarm um, we take a look at, it would not be considered a complete SIF since it does not achieve a safe state. It just issues an alarm to minimize damage. If we want that to be a SIF, you need to include a final action to achieve a state safe. Say, um, have a sprinkler system put on. So if you look at what a SIF is, you can understand that they are needed and they are very important for um, many different reasons. And to have a safety instrumented function work properly, a good way of doing that is having an assigned safety integrity level. So what is a safety integrity level? IEC 61511 defines a safety integrity level as a discrete level, one through four, of specifying the safety integrity requirements of the safety in instrumented function to be allocated to the safety instrumented systems. You have SIL one through four, where SIL four has the highest safety integrity level and SIL one is the lowest. IEC 61511 really only defines the requirements for SIL 1 through SIL 3 because it's expected that SIL 3 would be the maximum level in the process sector, well, except for nuclear, really. So if the very, very, very rare occurrence that a SIL 4 
is needed. IEC 61511 refers back to the details in IEC 61508. So you might be saying, okay, there's a lot of information already given off. Um, how do we know what to use? How do we know what to do? And this visual of the bridge to safety is one of the best um, things to simplify, the visuals to simplify this process for you. On one side, you have, you want to get from the front to the back safely and it's using IEC 61508. If it breaks it down into planning, um, you have your systematic and your random failure protection and all of these little pieces of information to hold this bridge up safely. If you have one of the main columns or even one of the support beams broken or loose, this entire bridge will fall down. So even if you do 90% of functional safety correctly and you don't worry about the planning or you don't worry about the systematic failures or the random failures, you will not have a complete bridge of functional safety. So each portion of that bridge can be divided up into the safety life cycle and IEC 61511, this is the safety life cycle. It's the same safety life cycle from IEC 61508. It can be divided in the analysis phase, the design phase, and the operational phase. We're going to take apart these three phases and look more closely at each one and what they involve. So let's start with the design phase, or the analysis phase, sorry. The analysis phase um, in a safety instrumented system designed to automatically protect the industrial process, the steps required to do this cannot begin until the conceptual design of the product is complete. At that point, the process is examined for its potential hazards. The risk of each hazard is assessed by estimating the likelihood or the frequency of that occurrence and the consequence or the magnitude if it doesn't occur. For those risks that need to be reduced, a safety requirement is created. Often the need for safety can be achieved without a safety instrumented system. For those places where a safety instrumented system is actually needed and it's judged to be the best solution, you do a risk reduction target and define what safety integrity level that you will need. And a description of the needed safety function along with all of the important information, including the SIL documentation, are put together in a safety requirement specification. So going through this analysis phase, you look at each event, what could happen, What's the worst case scenario? What are the likelihoods that that's going to happen? And are you okay with that happening or not? You have to look at your tolerable risk guideline and what, how much risk your company is willing to accept or take. From there, you can divide it up and see if SIFs are required. If they're not, great. The des you can look at other designs or other risk reductions. If there is a safety function that's needed, you're going to look at SIL selection and risk reduction for each SIF. For those hazards where a safety instrumented system is required to achieve the necessary risk reduction, an order of magnitude value is called a safety integrity level. And you select your safety integrity level when you find how much risk you need to reduce. So in doing your risk reduction calculations or your safety integrity level calculations, 
your main objective is to specify the required risk reduction or the differences between the existing and the tolerable risk limits. And in doing so, you can see if your system needs to be a SIL-1, a SIL-2, or a SIL-3 system. In doing all of this, you are going to compare the process risk against the tolerable risk. You use decision guidelines to select the required risk reduction. And very importantly, you document the selection process. IEC 61508 and 511 put a very strong ev emphasis on documentation. If there are holes or gaps in some of the process, you might be doing everything right. But if you don't document the process, you might not get credit for it. So documentation is um, key to both of the standards. Once you know if you need a SIF or a SIL analysis done, you are then moved to the design phase of the safety life cycle. And um, this is also called the realization phase. Um, it begins with the conceptual design of the safety instrumented system based on the safety requirements specification that we just created out of documentation. The, you look at the desired technology and you choose what sensor, what logic solver, or final element or combination of all of them to be in your SIF. Once the technology is chosen, often you can either do a redundant configuration or redundant architectures based on the experience in the safety instrumented design. There are several different architectures that can be used depending on performance of the individual components needed for the system. You can look at a one out of one system or if you need to add a hardware fault tolerance or a redundancy, you can look at a one out of two system or a two out of three, or you can even look at systems with automatic diagnostics, say a one out of two D would be diagnostics. Um, if you have a device, um, an architecture such as two out of three configuration, what that means is there are three elements present and two of those devices must indicate a trip in order for that trip to be signaled. The next phase is the operation and maintenance phase of the safety life cycle. And this begins with validation of the design. The validation must answer questions like, um, does the system solve the problem identified during the hazard analysis? Have all the necessar assess sorry, have all the necessary design steps been carried out successfully? Has the design met the target SIL for each one of the safety instrumented functions? Um, what about has the maintenance procedures been created and verified? Or is there a management of change procedure in place or an impact analysis? What about the operator and maintenance personnel? Are they qualified? Are they already trained to know what is involved with this safety and instrument and function and what could go wrong? And all of these questions and a lot more need to be answered before um, proceeding into startup and operation. So if you go through the safety life cycle, you are designing against, um, you're designing strength against random failures and you're designing strength against systematic failures. Next, I want to, I know that was quick and you might have some questions on um, the safety life cycle, but we also have, um, we have more webinars that the entire um, 
webinar or hours devoted just on the safety life cycle or even portions of the safety life cycle. So hopefully you got a general overview of what the safety life cycle for IEC 61511 entails. Next, I want to take a look at the importance of data integrity. And if you're using um, safety instrumented systems or numbers in calculations, why does it really matter to have the perfect number? Or let's look at some comparisons of different data sources. What does it really mean for good, too good to be true data? Um, we want to look at product stewardship and actually legal responsibilities. Well, first of all, the effect of bad data. Um, we have our bridge to safety once again. If you are using bad data to do your calculations, all of a sudden, some of the calculations, some of the efforts that you put into making your safe system safe will no longer have the effect that you were hoping to have. Um, bad data could be either optimistic data, and using the optimistic data you can have either an insufficiency in redundancy. You might really need a one out of two system, but you're using optimistic data, so now all of a sudden your calculations indicate you just need a one out of one. And you could have architectures that aren't safe enough for the risk reduction that you need. Or you could have insufficient testing. You might think that a proof test just needs to be done once every five years because of optimistic data, but that might not be the case. And the main objective is you could not reach the required risk reduction needed to have your operation run safely. So what does bad data mean? Well, if you look up bad in the Webster Dictionary, it's failing to reach an acceptable standard or poor, such as a bad repair job. Well, Exeter defines bad as data that leads to either unrealistic designs and often dangerous designs. Why do we really care about bad data? Well, risk varies with the different ways to use it. So if you are using bad data in a marketing brochure, your statement can be, well, we have very high quality stuff, it never ever fails. What's the risk for that? Well, if something goes wrong and you're making that statement because of bad data, either your reputation could suffer because you started exaggerating claims or you can look foolish. That's not a very high risk. But say you use that bad data in safety reliability calculations. And you say, look, our math shows you do not need any redundancy, and you never need um, a proof test or to test the function. You just put this um, final element in, and you never need to touch it again. It's good to go. Well, what's the risk for that? Well, it could potentially be very high. What if you do need a redundant system because you used overly optimistic data? Or what if you did need to proof test and proof test a lot more often than you were? And say that valve needs to be called into action and it's stuck open. It cannot shut down the process. Well, you have a potential loss of life due to under-designed safety system. You have potential um, accident happening and taking out your entire machinery and system. You have possible high environmental damages that could be done. And that's much more than just a bad reputation because you exaggerated claims. When you are using bad data in calculations, the consequences can be catastrophic. So, what are some companies missing? Well, one of the premises of 
IEC 61508 and IEC 61511 is that the automated protection system with diagnostics and periodic testing can provide a higher safety reliability than typical control functions. The standard outlines the steps that you must take to place that claim that this is higher safety reliability than typical. However, these steps are only good or only val valid if appropriate data is used. Once again, you could be doing the appropriate steps, you could be doing the appropriate calculations, but if you use optimis optimistic or bad data, the steps that you took to ensure the higher safety reliability mean nothing. So you can look at different failure rate data and failure rate data models. Um, there are predictive and estimated failure rate data models, and those we have webinars. I actually did one last week on just the failure rate data models. But there are different ways to um, receive data for your calculations. There are industry databases, there's um, manufacturers information such as a FAMIDA or a field failure study, and there's detailed um, field failure studies per application and models. And there are positives and negatives for every different failure rate data model, just like everything in life. Some are um, product specific, not application specific, some are neither, some are both. So when you're looking at failure rate data, you need to see what the source is to see how applicable it is for your situation. Um, one of the applications is field failure studies, which gives you a rich opportunity to obtain a failure rate on a product about a specific applications. However, most of the field failure studies don't give you enough information. It depends per manufacturer, per manufacturer, what they consider a failure or what does count in their field failure studies and what doesn't. Um, another way of doing failure rates is an FMEDA-based model and it is broken up by product, um, you send in your drawing with your bill of materials and your entire device is given a product failure rate, a product failure mode, and diagnostic coverage per the environment and application your device will um, go into. What we do at Exeta is we take the FMEDA results and validate and calibrate them per a proven and use study. So we calculate the product failure rate, the product failure mode, and diagnostic coverage from an FMEDA, and we compare that to the number of shipments and the number of failures that re are returned. Um, and make sure that there isn't a major issue happening with the field returns in a company. In doing all of this, it's part of the process, the FMEDA and the Proven and Use Analysis, is part of product certification. And for product certification, you can see that you you use IEC 61508 life cycle. It's a little bit different, but mostly the same as the IEC 61511 life cycle that we just looked at. Um, because this is product-based, not um, system-based. But there are two main fundamental concepts in IEC 61508. It has the safety life cycle, and the detailed engineering process, which is design reliability, but we also look at the probabilistic performance-based system design or the hardware reliability. And when you look at the life cycle and the process, you are ensuring 
that you're looking for systematic faults or you're looking for design mistake. You look at how the product was designed, how modifications are handled, how um, parts are sourced to make sure that you are making the best design for the application that you can. But you also look at the hardware reliability or the random failures to make sure that you are accounting for a random failure or random failure rates that can occur for the product. When you are doing the IEC 61508 certification, there's different milestones in the certification process. You first look to make sure that the hardware meets a PFD average for an expected or targeted SIL level. So you're going to look at failure rates, have a fail-safe design, have a diagnostic coverage, and you're going to look for failure rates through the PFD average calculations. You're going to also look at hardware. You're going to look and make sure that, well, for some instances, it meets the safe failure fraction or the Route 1H, but for other, um, or especially for simple mechanical devices, you're going to make sure that the technology has been proven in use or Route 2H. Um, you're also going to look if applicable, the software meets any process requirements for the targeted SIL, um, systematic fault avoidance. You're going to look at the product meeting the requirements for the um, SIL or the systematic fault avoidance and you're going to produce a safety manual for your customers or your users. That gives all of the functional safety information that they might need putting your product into a design. So what does this mean for product development? Well, you're going to need to document the safety life cycle. You're going to need and have requirements for safety-related function, a safety-related validation plan, a defined architecture. Um, some of the things that might or might not apply is a qualified um, tools, including a language, um, coding standard if necessary, um, following this coding standard, and to verify compliance to a coding standard of design requirements. At the end of product certification, you receive a certificate. And this certificate has a lot of very valuable information on it. And we have webinars and blogs on the different parts of the certificate, what to look for in your certificate, or if you're buying a product, what you need what information you need to make sure is on that certificate. A good certification assessment will demonstrate the high quality of design for hardware, for software, for manufacturing quality, and a good certification assessment will check to see that the proper documentation is provided and that you receive or you give out a functional safety manual that has all of the information for using a product in a safety function. And these are just a quick look at some typical documents that we ask for in a um, evaluation. And once again, if you're a simple valve, you might not need all of this. If um, But this is just a snapshot of some of the typical project documents we look for. In certification, we ask for sample documents or your documents to send in to us, and then we create what we call a safety case. What we have done in our safety case tool is looked through IEC 61508 and taken apart each requirement that the standard lists that you need to comply with for either SIL 1 or SIL 2 or SIL 3. From that requirement, we make an argument based on the evidence that you have sent in. We will read your functional safety manual and we'll say, oh, in 
this page, this paragraph, you meet this requirement, and here is why. And we go through and make sure every single requirement for your safety assessment has been met. In the process, if there are any gaps or actions that still need to be addressed, we create um, a gap analysis or an action item list to make sure that by the end of the process, every single requirement has of the standard has been satisfied. Um, and from that, you receive your certification. So at this time, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. And um, while I pull this up, if you have any questions throughout or later that you think of, um, please feel free to email me and I will get to your questions as soon as I possibly can. Um, the first question is, can the complete valve assembly be certified? Yes, um, you can certify in a complete valve assembly. Can you define random and systematic failures further with examples if possible? Um, sure. We have, um, this is a kind of gray area, especially for the standard. Um, a lot of people can argue what is defined as random and what is defined as systematic. But Exeter defines a systematic failure, or the standard defines a systematic failure, as a failure that can be modified with a change of documentation or a process or a design. And a random failure cannot. A random, a systematic failure could possibly be a bug in a code or a systematic, something that you can change. Or a systematic failure could be you put the wrong tolerance on a design or your supplier of a material changed materials on you and you were not aware of this. And a failure occurred because of all of these or one of these options. When you find the failure, you can address the failure by making a process change and document it. And that would be a systematic failure. A random failure is one that cannot be necessarily counted on or a change to be done. Um, we do have, like I said, webinars and blogs. We actually have quizzes on what is defined as random and systematic because there are so many conversations on what random and systematic can be and what needs to be counted in failure rates. So if you have more questions, please um, feel free to go to the Exeter website. IEC 61508 can be demonstrated by certification. What about IEC 61511? Um, there is third party um, capability for IC 61511, we come in and do um, SIL verification. Um, you come in and have hazard analysis and LOPAs um, and FSA done. And all of this demonstrates that you meet the IEC 61511 standard. Has the Excellentia product requirements and arguments clauses been updated to the new IEC 61511 standard? Um, no, it has not yet been updated. I do not believe the new standard has officially been released. Um, at least part of it has, um, not the entire IEC 61511 standard has been. So once it has been approved and released in its entirety, uh, Excellentia will then be updated. S safety manuals, are they available for any SIL rated device? As an Exeter SIL rated device, 
that is one of our absolute requirements. Um, the standard does say it needs to be done, so if you purchase a SIL rated device and you are not given a safety manual, I would say ask for one. If they do not have a safety manual, um, that would automatically put up a red flag for me if I were you. Uh, the next question. Typically, when a product safety certificate reaches its expiration date, how quickly is a new certificate available to support their product? Um, that depends on the company itself. We always encourage when a, before the product is expired, we would like the process to already start renewing it. So it is a seamless transition. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen or the product is going to be obsolete or the company does not want to renew the certification and that could create a lapse. But typically we send or our customers usually come to us saying, okay, our three years is almost up. We need to do the recertification process and go through to make sure that any modifications, any changes are still accounted for and we are still accredited. The next question, how much time do you recommend to allow for recertification process? Um, that really depends on the complexity of the product. If it's something that it, and to get into more detail than might be necessary, a type A would be a simple mechanical device, a type B would have software involved. If we are looking at a type B device and you have to look at software and any modifications in the software, that might be a longer process. If you're looking at something for a recertification of a simple mechanical device such as a type A application, it would be um, less time. You could get the recertification done within a few months. It depends on um, the urgentness, I, guess, I don't think that's a word, the urgency of the product. If it's something that you have um, an emergency or urgency for and need it right away, we can certainly um, work with you to make sure your recertification is done as soon as you need it to be done. Are there any other questions? Well, at this time, we have no other questions. If you think of any later on, please feel free to email me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And I hope that everybody enjoyed the webinar and I hope it wasn't too much information thrown at you because functional safety can be confusing, especially if you're first getting involved in it. So if you have any questions, please ask. We understand and hope that everybody has a wonderful day or evening depending on where you are.